Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and I'm doing a movie review this week, and it's a very cult classic favorite of mine that came out in 1986 called Night of the Creeps. Yep, this movie is really the f one of the greatest underrated piece of entertainment that I've ever seen. For a horror movie that has the line simply this thrill me yep I was so thrilled to find this movie at Best Buy last year when I bought this at for a very good price at $7.99 and it's also pretty interesting because when this movie first came out in 1986 uh, August 22nd it didn't do so well at the box office and prior to this they were gonna make it into a cult following as it's as it turned out it was later released on home video by HBO video which at the time was known as HBO Canon video yeah they were releasing other different titles it was on VHS and Laserdisc and since then although maybe they might have a re-release VHS tape later on. I, I think Sony might have re-released it or possibly HBO. I'm not so sure. Um, since then, it's been on TV uh, many times on you know throughout the 90s. You know, it, it's been on cable like HBO, Cinemax, and Sci-Fi Channel, and many others. And since then. I haven't seen this movie for a very long time. Had a hard time looking for a copy of this film on VHS and no such luck. Yeah, it was extremely hard to find. The biggest problem was um, this movie had never had gone a, an official DVD release and Blu-ray until 2009. And we waited so long for that since then but I was really happy when it finally got released because after all this time I never thought I'd be able to see this movie again which is also interesting because I actually found an HD copy of the film since this movie wasn't going to see the light of day till later and yeah I went uh, I went online just finding a, a very rare copy of this movie you know, hoping to see this film after all these years in, in widescreen and hopefully in the much better quality it would deserve and, and when I had that HD copy of that film it blew me away it was definitely like a DVD release that should have been already available at the time and that was back in 2006 when I finally had a copy and, and when when I heard this movie was finally going to be released, I was so excited because I never thought I would see this in the palm of my hand. Yeah. N not to mention uh, the Monster Squad too. That movie also had that same problem, and surprisingly enough, it's the same writer and director, yeah, Fred Decker. He he also had that same problem with that movie. That didn't do so well at the box office either, and and yet. We had a hard time waiting for this movie to be released in widescreen, high definition, and the works. Not to mention tons of great extras that you never thought you would find on that particular release. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing how the, these two films, you know, never got any credit it deserves. It's a shame because these are much better movies than any of the films that we've been getting over the past couple years now especially today's horror movies yeah exactly man that's why I'm happy that it's finally released and hopefully it always will be remembered no matter what yeah. this you just never get tired of this movie especially with, with an awesome cast right here you know everything from Jason Lively from National Lampoon's European Vacation to Tom Atkins you know from The Fog 
Escape from New York, Creep Show. Man, this guy had a great resume. Yeah. Also, Lethal Weapon and all those other films that followed. This movie was definitely, you know, one of Tom Atkins' best performance in a cult film like this. That you just can't help but love this character. Especially with that line, Frill Me. Well, <laughs> yeah, I just enjoy this movie a lot. Anyway, um, let's get right to it because uh, I want to be able to talk more on this than ever before. It stars Jason Lively with Jill Rillo, Tom Atkins, Steve Marshall, Wally Taylor, Bruce Solomon, Robert Kino, Alan J. Kaser from the TV show Mama's Family. He yeah, went on to play Bubba. Yeah. David Paymer yeah, went on to do a lot of work over the years. And Dick Miller. And it's written and directed by Fred Deckard, who later went on to do The Monster Squad. And of course, the dreaded awful sequel to the Robocop franchise Robocop 3. The movie begins set in an alien spacecraft in 1959. One small alien is carrying a canister that has all these weird strange experiment that he had created and he's being chased by two aliens which all of a sudden he had shoot the canister into space crash lands to earth. And suddenly a college student who has taken his date to a parking spot had spotted a falling star and started to investigate only to find out that the so-called falling star actually shoots its right back to the woods. Then he spotted a canister that landed on the path of, of a criminally insane mental patient. And he has an axe and he's about to um, kill his date. While the canister was there on that path, all these slugs decided to come right out and one of them went straight into his mouth and died. 27 years later, you know, during Pledge Week at Corman University, which actually that's where it taken place, which, <laughs> yeah, of course, this movie did have a lot of character names and all this other stuff that's dedicated to all these uh, directors' names such as David Cronenberg, Roger Corman, George A. Romero, John Landis, you, know, you name it. <laughs> it's hard to believe you know they had to use those names <laughs> for, for characters. Well, anyway, Chris Romero, who's played by Jason Lively, has suddenly had pines over his lost love, which he's supporting by his disabled friend Jay Z, yeah, in uh, Clutches, played by Steve Marshall. He was trying to struggle to find a girl that he really loves. That is until he spotted a beautiful girl named Tiffany Cronenberg, who's played by Joe Whitlow, and suddenly falls instantly in love. But in order to get her attention, he decided to join a fraternity club that's run by Bradford, who's played by Alan Kayser. He's also his boyfriend of Cynthia, to being the head of the clan. His best plan was to take him to stealing a cadaver from the University Medical Center and deposit it on the steps of the sorority house, which is Kappa Delta. Chris and JC, however, had found a cryogenically frozen corpse in the secret lab, and when, when suddenly they, they opened the machine and he was set free, which all of a sudden, he started moving, and the two had finally escaped, only to find out that a scientist, who's played by David Paymer, had discovered what was going on inside the lab, and that's when you know the corpse had only killed the scientist, and which turned out to be, as we speak, you know, a zombie. And already a zombie by now which all the slugs has already, you know, already covered. Anyway, um, 
Once uh, that same corpse had went into the same location where he was trying to find his date you know, during that time, he spotted Cynthia and you know, while getting ready to bed, and and all these and all these thugs started coming by and going straight to the entire sorority house all the way around. Yeah, you know, that's when she discovered it. So meanwhile, Detective Ray Cameron, who's played by Tom Akins, yeah, one of those uh, smart Alec detectives, is called into the cryogenically lab to break in, where he discovers one of the bodies, which apparently the boy who had discovered the alien experiment is now missing. You know, but then they did later find the body of the scientist. Son had woken up, and actually uh, later killed the janitor. You know, yeah, the janitor who who actually spotted uh, Chris and Jay Z, who actually you know started screaming like banshees, as they referred to during once they were questioning you know to the police about the incident that just happened. So since then, more bodies started to come by, and you know Cynthia was already you know talking to to Chris and Jay Z about what happened that night when he spotted that corpse, and. That's when everything seems to go, yeah, and really they thought, you know, Chris was actually going to be lucky enough to have the girl, you know, as a result. Well, somehow Jay-Z winds up in the bathroom, and that's where he spotted um, the dead janitor. Yeah, already dead, and suddenly all these slugs started coming around, crawling everywhere. You know, he was trying to, he actually spotted one of them, and he actually uh, tried to light a match and kill them with fire to see if this will happen but unfortunately he had a hard time escaping because one of them was about to go straight to his pants and he didn't make it but he did prepare for uh, Chris to to make an instant message on on his tape recorder to to find a better way to kill these slugs that's crawling around everywhere yeah. so he actually asked uh, detectives Ray Cameron to uh, to team up and get some of these you know, flame flowers and all these other uh, guns out there to to stop all these zombies which are already being possessed by these slugs everywhere including their boyfriends from this from the other sorority house and you know that's already in the bus and we already seen a lot of those other um, you know we already see like you know pets animals like like a cat and, and a dog already being possessed by one of those already killed that one lady you know, during the middle of the film and yep so so it's up to them to stop them from becoming one of those zombies which apparently it's going to be a lot tougher to to deal with them since they're everywhere so that's pretty much what the movie was all about <laughs> this movie did totally thrill me because of all of this that they put in it felt like this movie was made definitely to to pay a tribute to all these classic 50s and all the way through the through the 80s of you know, science fiction you know, horror movies that they had. And I always loved films like this because they knew they wanted to come up with something this fun and clever that it actually works. Because, you know, we had a lot of films like that. I mean, the fact that they added an alien setting from the beginning you know, all the way towards the end or so. Oh, well, that's when we found out, and all and everything that they put into it, it was just amazing, and it all became into like like any other zombie movie that we often see, you know, like Night of the Living Dead type of thing, but it's done in a very awesome way by using these slugs, those creepy slugs that they put into it, that goes into inside their bodies and they turn into a, as we speak zombie. Very clever idea. Which, surprisingly enough, um, they actually started doing that in later movies, too, with a film like Slitter. Yeah, yeah, the, um, the 2005 film with Elizabeth Banks and Michael Wooker. Yeah, this was yet another movie where they started using slugs that started crawling around everywhere and they all become instantly grotesque creatures out there. You know, they, and that's what happened. But uh, this one is original, and I'm just amazed that this movie never got any credit it deserves. It's just a shame. 
because it had everything that they had in one particular 80s horror film. And the characters were just awesome. Let's face it. They had a lot of awesome dialogue that they put in. And anything from from Jason Lively, Steve Marshall to uh, to Tom Atkins. Uh, you just can't go wrong with this film. And they, they, they put a lot of good effort to it. I mean, it's amazing that that writer and director Fred Decker had actually came up with something this fresh. This is definitely his, his best work, you know, that he's ever done. And then later on he did Monster Squad and and that's like yeah, that's like a tribute to the universal monsters out there. Plus a mix of uh, the Goonies right there. Yeah, I, I love the idea of that film. Yeah, it's just it's awesome. I mean yeah. You never get tired of this movie, and it's just such a shame that, you know, we never get horror movies like this anymore. Yeah, where where they actually had films where they, yeah, see, they didn't have, they had a lot of great special effects that they put into it. They had a lot of makeup, and it was really cool that they created these slugs, you know, that's so, you know, a little big, almost in this size, like worms and stuff, yeah, but, but they're slimy and they move they move this fast they go straight all the way from each corner to the other to the next man I mean this is really good stuff right here and it's sad that we don't see something like this in today's movies everything is just CGI and, and it just doesn't have that creation that it once it once was you know and it was just awesome. It's definitely the best uh, zombie movie I've ever seen, and I just never get tired of it. And I'm just happy that I finally own the Blu-ray with tons of great extras, you know, including the trailer, new interviews. Well, even though this was 2009, you know, it had a lot of great interviews with the cast. You know, half of the main cast, by the way. I would have loved to see an interview with Alan Kayser, though, but that's okay. I got to see those actors with uh, Fred Deckard and all the other uh, creators behind the film. Everybody, it, it was just, just awesome. Um, but I got to tell you, um, definitely check this movie out if you must. Uh, go out, you know, find a copy at your local uh, video store if if they exist everywhere in this location. Maybe, maybe buy a copy if you get a chance. Maybe go to you know, Target, Best Buy, or any other, but or Fries, you, know, you name it, to find a copy of this movie if you if you get a chance, because this movie, um, you just never get tired of it. Now, despite of the fact that its running time is only 88 minutes, you, know, you get it. It's just it's a treat. I forgot to mention that this movie also had uh, since the Blu-ray is the director's cut. They have two endings to the film. The original ending, which actually came out in theaters, had an ending where that where they show the dog from outside of the porch, you know, where he got uh, Alan Kayser's character, Brad. And, yeah, it's one of them shooting his mouth, and the same one that was going, you know, that was chasing um, all the guys that's already inside the bus, and then and the crash somehow actually shows up and some of the slugs start to go right straight from the, from the dog's mouth into Cynthia and the movie ends this way so yeah it's one of those cheesy and scary endings that they put in while the other one um, which a lot of people said it was a much better ending was the uh, the one with this base craft that was on top um, where the cemetery is, which proceeded after you know, a burnout Ray Cameron, yeah, already dead already, and already cracked open on his head, filled with these slugs, and they started shooting all the way straight to it. You see an alien spacecraft inside the cemetery, and they're trying to look for the experiment that's trying to fly all the way around this area. So once you see a spotlight shooting around, yeah. that was a good ending too. Uh, I actually like both of them. Both of these endings were really cool, uh, no matter what which one they choose to, to end this movie. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I had to give it away, but it's it's one of those two awesome endings I really like to see in films like this. The, it's such a shame they would have had used that ending originally in theaters, but they had to cut to the to those cheesy endings, you know, because they always want to end with a jump scare. <laughs> but that's okay. I, I think it's worth it. Okay, well, that's Night of the Creeps. I'm definitely going to film myself after watching it. <laughs> over and over and over again. So anyway, I give this movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.